In Southeast Asia, thousands of people have experienced the merciless grip of the loan shark. Illegal moneylenders target people who are desperate for cash with nowhere else to go. Charging interest rates that are nothing short of criminal, loan sharks squeeze every last dollar out of their victims using intimidation, violence, and even torture to make sure they get paid. In 2011, in the Southeast Asian nation of Singapore, notorious loan shark Ku Ju Huat was the subject of an intense 12-month police investigation. Detectives knew that Ku was the mastermind behind a loan sharking network that stretched across the country. But what officers lacked was the hard evidence to put him away. Of course the main ringleader. We have investigated him for the past one year. Officers are deployed to tailgate him, keep observation of him. Police work revealed that Ku owned a vintage car, a motorcycle, a large apartment, and a lavish penthouse. Officers were granted a warrant for his arrest. On January 24, 2011, police entered the home of 39-year-old Ku and began collecting evidence. A laptop and several mobile phones were found, loaded with the names and phone numbers of Ku's accomplices and clients. In addition, 40,000 US dollars in cash is found at one of his homes. We found handphones, cash about 60,000 in one of the safe and a computer, which uh, we found some Excel sheet believed to be data of those debtors. And all these items were seized and Ku Johat was brought back to CID for for the interview. Although the evidence is enough to convict Ku of loan sharking, police worry it won't be enough to convince a judge that Ku is the kingpin they know him to be. The officers needed more evidence and believed there to be more money concealed in Ku's apartment. We decided to go back to Loyang, his apartment again, to conduct another search. Ku Juha was very composed. He, could, he actually told me that there's nothing in this apartment because I believe he would not think that we would find anything. This time, Ku's apartment was searched by four officers committed to seeing the crime boss behind bars. Okay, when we brought him back to his Loyang residence, we are suspicious of every corner of his house. After searching his house for hours, there was still no sign of the evidence they needed. Finally, the officers made a breakthrough. On the first floor, we did not find anything else. But on the second floor, where the bedroom is, we found a wardrobe. The layout of the, the, the room is quite interesting. Um, so we started to knock on the wall. At the back of this wardrobe, there's a hollow sound. That's when um, we exert more force to knock on the, the the wall behind the wardrobe. That's where we found an entrance to a concealed room. It was a critical moment in the investigation. Officers carefully searched the secret room. Two combination safes were found, each completely filled with bills. When you open up the safe, we found that these two safes was stuffed, literally stuffed with $50 notes to the rim, and also coins, two big plastic bags of coins was found inside the room. We also found uh, documents of bank statements belonging to Ku Juhat. The investigators had hit the jackpot. In total, more than a quarter of a million dollars in cash was found. With detailed client information discovered in the laptops and handphones, and now a pile of cash, police had all the evidence they would need to prove that Ku was the boss behind the syndicate. He was charged with 122 counts of money lending and corruption. On September 19, 2011, Ku Ju Huat was sentenced to five and a half years in prison, was given a $300,000 fine and 21 strokes of the cane. But police didn't stop there. Over the coming months, officers would track down and arrest six of Ku's top henchmen. 
Koju Huat case is significant because we have effectively cracked down the entire unlicensed money lending syndicate and it sent out a strong message to the rest of the syndicates who are out there. But when one criminal syndicate fails, others are prepared to take its place. Authorities fear that the loan sharking problem in Singapore is far from being resolved. In 2010 alone, over 16,000 cases of loan sharking and related crimes were reported. There are many, many syndicates now, not only single individual uh, loan sharks who do a small time business, there are also big syndicates who give away hundreds of thousands of dollars. Illegal money lenders prey on people who are in dire need of money. Most of their victims have been rejected by all legal means of getting a loan. The loan shark offers an instant loan, paid in cash, but at interest rates between 15 to 25% per week, a debt of $1,000 can double in one month. Syndicate bosses control the group with various levels of managers and henchmen carrying out orders from the top. In the 70s and 80s, when you talk about loan shark activities, it was not random. And the money involved was not that big and easier to control. But today, the loan sharks, the syndicates are going on. And of course, the big boy doesn't want to get caught. He sent all his soldiers to do all the dirty work and so that he will be safe. How it goes works. OK, I, I don't know, my boss, is second man or he's a third man, we don't know. Only they know. You take from who, who give you this order, who give you this order. It's very confidential. Sammy is a former gang member who entered the Loan Shark Syndicate starting at the lowest rung. Known as a runner, Sammy's job was to recover money from those who had not paid up by any means necessary. We do two, three attempts, polite way, aggressive way, threatening way. Three ways we, we use. Cannot, then we have to use violence. We wait early in the morning, we see what time he go work, 6, 6.30, 4.30, we hide below. When he come, we carry a pipe and everything, break, break his leg. With police in Singapore cracking down on loan shark operations, the syndicate's tactics have changed. To avoid the attention of police, Loan sharks now use harassment intended to publicly shame the debtor. We go and shout at the door, make the neighbor see, make them embarrassment. Uh, follow them, trace them, go to shopping center, market, go there and shout, you see? So these are the solution. But outside of Singapore, loan sharks are becoming increasingly violent in the way they recover their loans. Across the border in Malaysia, illegal money lending syndicates are kidnapping and chaining up their victims for months, using violence and physical torture to get their money. Across Asia, loan shark syndicates are showing just how far criminals will go for money. In Malaysia, illegal money lending groups use fear and violence to keep the cash flowing. May 28, 2009, police enter an abandoned shop house in the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia's capital city. What they uncover is one of the most extreme cases of loan shark brutality ever seen in Malaysia. Three men were found, shackled to a wall and suffering from various injuries. The men had been locked up for two months, fed only bread and water and had been repeatedly beaten with sticks. The victims owned between 400 to 1,000 US dollars to a loan shark syndicate known as the Crystal Nine Gang. There was no limit to the brutality used by the Crystal Nine loan sharks. You know, they chain the victims, a uh, few thousand that chain the victims. There's one woman who chained until I had to beat her. Five members of the syndicate were arrested under the emergency ordinance law in Malaysia after authorities uncovered documents that showed the gang raking in more than 15,000 US dollars a day. This extreme measure is rarely used by authorities, skipping formal court proceedings and sending the criminals straight to prison. The 
police use the EO emergency ordinance and put them in the in the lockup you now for a few years. Uh. You know, you no need trial. You don't have to go to court. Uh. And that's that in fact is a form of a deterrent. The Crystal Nine case brought loan sharking into the spotlight, spreading the fear that many more groups could be conducting similar operations. Investigators began looking into the nature of these organizations, revealing why ordinary people turned to these criminals for financial help. One phone call, the money can be even banging, or the money you can just go meet in certain places and you get it. And that is how they get so convenient. So in this case, many would like to take on the loan shark. Where else, if you go to the finance institution, you go to the bank for that matter, you know how long it will take. Months before you get approval. Loan shark syndicates are now highly organized, looking into every aspect of their clients before approving a cash loan. A former member of a loan shark syndicate, Tom, was responsible for conducting background checks on new clients. I be he tong yi, then I oh once the loan sharks are convinced that the client can pay back at least the principal amount, the loan is approved, and the scam begins. On the same day that the loan is issued, one interest payment is taken directly off the principal amount. As the interest accumulates at weekly rates, a second payment of 200 would be due the following week. In this way, the loan sharks make their money back within four weeks on interest alone. When the loans involve larger sums of money, the victim's debt quickly spirals out of control, and the criminals soon lose their patience. In Singapore, police have discovered a disturbing new trend. Loan shark gang members appear to be getting younger. In early 2009, a total of 124 loan shark arrests were made. About 25% of those arrested were under the age of 19. Local youths are now being hired as a cheap source of labor to harass those in debt, and at the same time, adding another layer of secrecy and protection for the syndicate's bosses. These days, loan sharking syndicates are loosely linked. They outsource their business function. They employ debtors or even youth who are easily attracted to fast cash to commit harassment. Because of the syndicate is loosely linked, those runners arrested may not be linked or associated with the upper level of the syndicate, which make enforcement difficult in order to pin down the upper level of the loan sharking syndicate. Youths are recruited from schoolyards using posters and leaflets that are handed out by gang members. The advertisements promise easy money for part-time work. Jonathan was recruited as a loan shark runner in Singapore when he was still in his teens. Youths are paid about 40 US dollars to throw red paint at the homes of those who haven't paid up. The more houses they cover in paint, the more money the youths make. Not 
他不想玩的话，我们就是离开那个地方。离开的地方之后，半夜我们上去呃喷漆啦、破漆。Over time, however, Jonathan's criminal activities began to escalate. The syndicate bosses started to demand increasingly violent acts from the youths. 我们上门敲门，找这个找这个人的名字。有几次老板不想收回来，我们就就是打他，打打的蛮严重。From beatings to kidnappings and recruiting youths to do their dirty work, loan sharks have become extremely violent and unpredictable in their methods. With the strike of a match, the loan shark syndicate threatens to put an end to the life of a debtor and potentially kill countless others in the process. Violence and greed fuels the loan shark business in Asia. Debtors are forced to pay interest rates that are nothing short of criminal. And when loan sharks come calling, not even the victims' families or neighbors are safe. Aside from physical beatings and torture, these groups have also been known to vandalize homes and cars using acid. But perhaps the most dangerous of all tactics is that of arson. Recently, loan sharks has adopted a more aggravated techniques in committing their harassment, such as setting fire at your house. This act itself definitely caused. Dangers not only to debtors but also to other innocent victims staying at the same area. Numerous cases have been reported of fires being set by loan sharks in an effort to strike fear into their debtors. In central Singapore, in 2011, four men were charged with setting fire to the front doors of eight apartments. With more than 500 people inhabiting these buildings, the incidents could easily have resulted in disaster. I tell you some of this, uh, what you call the employee of the loan shark. I have cases, spray paint on the, the, the vehicle, spray acid, I have cases when they, they try to burn the house and burn them inside. What happened is a fire, the whole family killed, innocent life. The use of arson as an act of intimidation shows just how far these men will go to get their money back. Over the years, the legal loan shops have become more brazen because they have more, more at stake, they have lent more money out, they need to recoup. For their victims, trapped between financial debt and the constant threat of death, there may seem to be no way out. But there is another option for those who cannot afford to repay their loan. Debtors are now given a choice. Suffer the consequences at the hands of vicious criminals or join them and become part of the syndicate. In 2009, Malik borrowed 700 US dollars from a loan shark. It was a mistake that would change his life forever. I borrowed money from an illegal money lender in 2009, June, $1,000. I need to pay every week $200, and I paid more than $2,000, and after this, I could not pay. Five months after taking the loan, Malik was coerced into working for the gang as a runner. He was first asked to harass others who were in debt by vandalizing their homes. I told them I cannot pay anymore, Eddie. They offer me to do a runner for them, I work for them. Then they ask me to pour paint in people's house, which I didn't want to do. Then they give me another option to open a bank account for them so that other debtors can transfer the money to them, my account. When you owe money to the loan shark, and the loan shark say, if you don't pay, you do certain things for me, like open up a bank account for me, and you do it and you will be considered as abetting, assisting in the running of a, a loan shark business. And when you're caught, you go to jail too. By agreeing to open an account for a criminal syndicate, Malek would be committing a federal offense. If caught, he would be facing prison and possibly even corporal punishment. But the alternative may be far more severe. They threaten me that they will harm my family or they will burn my house. So that's why I was very afraid and opened an account for them. They told me once I open a bank account for them, nothing will happen. Nobody will know that. They told me I trust them, but in the end I was in a sentence to prison. Any person who is convicted in assisting the loan sharks, such as opening a bank accounts, will face a fine of uh, between 30,000 to 300,000 and an imprisonment of not more than four years. Caning of not more than six strokes may be imposed as well. There are a lot of people who say this is not fair because the 
victim had no choice. But he had a choice. He could have reported the matter to the authorities, you know, that's what he should do. Because if he, if he doesn't do that and he continued to help the loan shark, he's going to get into bigger and bigger problems. Cases like Malak's have alerted authorities to the growing crisis. Singapore police have since launched a crackdown on loan sharking activities, forming specialized units to topple the criminal syndicates. In 2010, a dedicated anti-loan sharking unit called the Unlicensed Money Lending Strike Force was set up in the Criminal Investigation Department, where the upper echelons of the loan shark syndicates were targeted. After two years of specialized criminal investigations, dozens of syndicates across the country have been dismantled. On a single night in November of 2011, Singapore police arrested a total of 86 gang members in one of the biggest loan shark takedowns in Asian history. Many coverts and also overt officers are deployed at the ground uh, for successful operations. So such island-wide operations uh, have been crucial and uh, successful for the police in crippling and also disrupting the loan sharking activities. With police taking down criminal syndicates from top to bottom, former gang member Tong knew it was time to get out of the loan sharking business. After 15 years of flirting with prison, Tong witnessed the arrest of three members of his syndicate, an event that forced him to reevaluate his criminal life. Criminals who use extortion and the threat of violence to ruin lives and destroy families live in constant fear of the authorities. But Tong now strives to make an honest living. And although it is a far cry from the loan shark group he once helped to control, Tong appears to have turned over a new leaf, saying goodbye to the criminal underworld forever. So we have good people and good people. We don't do it, we don't do it, we don't do it, we don't do it. But now, 